So thank you again uh, for being with us. You have the pleasure of, uh, of my company for the next uh, 45 or so minutes. So uh, I'm hoping that some of the information that I can provide to you will be uh, of use and uh, uh, help you understand a bit more uh, the issues that are at hand for severe armoured vehicles. So what I wanted to do really in this presentation is highlight the great challenge that we know being fleet management and explain that it's a holistic approach. There are many, uh, as the slide says, um, many people are you know, categorising fleet management as servicing and spare parts and filling up with fuel. And to an extent that is certainly true. And uh, I want to challenge people to think beyond that and more broadly, if you like, more holistically, that the issue of fleet management, in fact, is part and parcel of the, of the life cycle of, uh, of a civilian armoured vehicle. So I want to take you on a journey and lead you through this life of the vehicle and along the way emphasise a few key issues that will help build up that note and that concept that at the end of the process, which is the management of the vehicles in the, in the field, that in fact considerations are taken very early in the life cycle. And so we'll talk a little bit about firstly some definitions and some context and talk about the capability life cycle. And I suppose I was quite fortunate I was trained through the Department of Defence in military capability acquisition. And it was drummed in from a very early time about you know, the capability life cycle. It's not just here's a checkbook, there's a product and away you go. And it was highlighted very, very much so at the beginning of the Iraq war, I think it was, and the Australian Special Forces were operating and they didn't have the kit that they needed to um, have themselves uh, ready to do what they wanted to do. And so they invariably just looked at the Jane's magazine and they'd go to the back cover and they'd come to me and say, you see that? We want 100 of those. And go, well, yeah, OK, but how are you going to use it? How does it m merge into your mission operation? How are you going to maintain it? How are you going to dispose it? Don't worry about it. Not your problem. I just want 100 of those. And, of course, disaster hit. We'll talk a little bit about design, taking on further some of the issues that Nira was able to, uh, uh, to discuss earlier on. This then flows into the procurement action and from that then the manufacturing and the project management to actually build the vehicle and present it into the field. And again, issues of consideration in these processes will have a direct effect on the fleet management itself. Uh, then uh, speak about how it is that each of you can make an impact for the fleet manager who's sitting in the middle of wherever, who has to deal with the problems of the vehicles and uh, their challenges. And I was talking to someone last night and you know, every vehicle that they have, there's three to five questions. Well, now multiply that by 100 vehicles. And there are hundreds of questions coming in from the field. How can you make an impact to positively influence that? All right, let me uh, start by showing you something here. Hopefully the video will work. Bell 
Melbourne Cup and here's Vauban on the outside of future history and Bow and Declare between them. Absurd is also chiming in. 400 metres to go. It's Absurd moving up on the outside for Zach Purden. A length in front but without a fight is running on right down the centre of the track. Without a fight up to Absurd. Bow and Declare and Shiraz the bolter. It's without a fight. 100 metres to go. Two or three lengths in front coming away from Shiraz and also Solcom. Without a fight. Mark Zara, a Melbourne Cup champion, wins it by two lengths. Second in the race was Sulcombe, third Shiraz. They were followed by a photo for four. Did no favours at all for Mackenzie. They sense. make the steal, and Revolt is running. He is charging into the Ford 50. He's got May just a foot or two behind him. It fell back for Nick Revolt. Oh, that's a brilliant goal for Nick Revolt. Nothing but Nick. Nick at his best. Revo puts it through, and the Saints are within 31 points. More about that later. Um, but the issue that of, uh, of, of winning and how it is that we can win. So let me give you a, a, just a brief introduction about myself. Uh, I did about 20 years, I won't say imprisonment, but 20 years in the, uh, in the private sector in manufacturing, research and development. I was involved with a start-up going back, oh gosh, about 30 years ago, uh, as well as education. And then moved into the uh, Australian Department of Defence through the acquisition arm, which at the time was called Defence Material Organisation. And over a period of time was the, uh, became the project director for the special vehicles uh, projects that were required for different arms of the Australian Defence Force. As a result of that and a job that I got from the Department of Foreign Affairs to build their first proper fleet of civilian armoured vehicles, which was Chevrolet Suburbans, I was there seconded to Canberra, to the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, to manage the civilian armoured fleet for the Australian government. And uh, my responsibilities were for, for DFAT, for the diplomatic arm, for working with the trade organisation, federal police, uh, special groups within defence themselves, uh, etc. So it was a large and varied fleet with a, a variety of users that, uh, that were the clients, if you like. In 2015, I uh, thought I retired. That didn't last too long. And, in fact, then started Armoured Consulting with Yoni Lapidot. And the aim really was and still remains, is to fill the gap that I had as a, a program manager and a fleet manager and a procurement officer and a contracts manager and spare parts analyst, was to be able to talk to people of like mind in order to understand better as to how I can do my job. And I found a gap uh, that existed. I was the Australian representative on the IV SAG, so I could talk with the Department of State guys and the FCOs and oh, DFAT, Global uh, Affairs Canada today, and uh, many of the other nation states. But we all were talking amongst ourselves. I wanted an ability to talk with suppliers and component manufacturers and use, you know, users in the broad spectrum. And it was because of that that I saw that there is a need for an independent uh, advisory body, a consulting firm that can be in a matrix situation, come in and uh, do a job, answer some questions, perform certain tasks, independent of all the different stakeholders that there are. All right. Let's deal with a couple of, uh, uh, of, of definitions and look at context. So the first issue I keep saying is a holistic approach is one of my favourite terms. And it's looking at the complete system rather than just each individual part. And we, we, uh, we talk about stovepipes and in many of the government offices where the different parts of that office are performing different tasks and the correlation and interrelationship between them is not necessarily as good as it could be. So we're trying to give this concept of a, of a holistic approach. We then talk about whole of life. And so again, whole of life takes you from that conception uh, in from the, uh, I keep talking about capability development, 
functional performance specifications, understanding what it is that this capability, this asset, needs to be able to do, and then taking it through design development, production, the manufacturing, distribution, the operation, the maintenance through life support, training, and then disposal. And then we use the term fleet management. Uh, bantied around, different people have different views of it. Uh, but again, you know, I think that definition of you know, that strategic development and planning control of the fleet to help achieve the most effective and efficient use of the assets. And that includes, and what are the assets? It's the, the, it involves the, the costs, the operational availability. If you've got 10 vehicles in the fleet and eight are in the workshop, you don't really have a fleet. You just have a very big maintenance problem. Uh, and the issues of op occupational health and safety, as Neil was talking about, the ability to escape a vehicle, all part and parcel of that. How the people riding in the vehicle is as critical as all the other components that make up through that, uh, through that process. All right, so let's just spend a few moments and talk about this whole of life capability life cycle. And I think it's best to consider in three different phases. So the first phase is really the front office, if you like, looking about defining what are the requirements of this capability. And uh, a particular project I did many years ago, and we were, it was involving a truck as it happens. And the capability was that this truck had to tow 10 tonnes behind it and be able to achieve a speed of 80 kilometres an hour up a particular incline. OK, well, that's what the user needed. All right, well, now I know if that's the requirement, how do I then build that into the specification in the manufacturing? The performance and the function of the vehicle itself, uh, understanding how that human dynamics uh, is going to interact with the vehicle. You might have a great vehicle that is a VR9 and it's 5,500 kilos and it's a great price and it looks all terrific. But if someone can't get in and out of the vehicle because the door opening, the aperture is too narrow, well, you don't really have a viable capability. That then flows into the design reviews. And in most of our cases here, the requirement is that of uh, an up armourer using their designs. But that doesn't mean that that is sacrosanct, that is set in stone. And the procurement agencies do have a, an ability to discuss the designs, not fundamentally change them because there was a certification issue, but to be able to discuss the design and their requirements so that there is a, a, a good match. And that then leads in, obviously, to the manufacturing of the vehicle. Once that's done, and I, I don't belittle any aspect of it, but... I actually think that's the easy part because we've been doing it for 20 odd years. There are people in this room and in the industry who are far more knowledgeable than, than certainly I am on that manufacturing, the designing, the protection aspects and have been doing it for 20 plus years. Once the vehicle goes into the field, that's where the challenges lie. That's the fleet management it starts to have an impact and... and uh, causes all those thousands of emails that many of you are getting each day. So the introduction into service, so that the field, the, the field office know what this vehicle is about and how they're going to use it and how they're going to maintain it. The technical documentation from the up armourer. I have great respect for the up armourers, but the level of technical documentation is somewhat lacking. It makes it very difficult to maintain the vehicle in the fleet. And if you're sitting in a remote area, whether it's in, in Africa or Middle East, Eastern Europe, and in the Asia Pacific area, and there is not a uh, robust enough, for example, wiring diagram, wiring plan, when something has to be replaced that is an electrical piece of kit, there's going to be a challenge. It means that there's a delay in repairing the vehicles. The vehicle's off the road. Operational availability is reduced. And now the ambassador, country officer, uh, the whomever is on the phone screaming, what is this piece of rubbish that I'm dealing with because I can't do my mission and my job is now impacted. The through life support program itself that is his, which is the supply chain, the spare parts, the knowledge of the workshops, the selection of the workshops, how do all these meet in together? And then of course the training. 
It's all very nice to have a vehicle. It's all very nice to have the technical documentation workshops. But if the people aren't trained to perform, we're struggling. After a period of time, then the question comes, what are we going to do with the vehicle? It's already five years, seven years. Can there be a life of type extension? Can there be an assessment of the fit for purpose um, uh, condition of the vehicle? And then move it for another three years for a small investment as, as against a significant capital investment. And then the big, the big challenge that everyone has is disposal. And that's a whole other story. All right. Let's now just spend a few moments looking at uh, the requirements in the design phase. And as you go through this phase is I'm trying to encourage people to think about the people in the field who are needing to support, maintain this vehicle cost effectively, high operational level of uh, uh, operational availability and in a... Um, and in a manner that then the principals can do their work. First issue is that of the areas of operation, in understanding where the vehicle is going to be used. If it's used in the east of Ukraine, in, uh, it's one aspect. If it's in the lovely German-built roads of Baghdad, it's a different issue. Um, or the, uh, as my very early training was, the horrible, not horrible, I should rephrase that, sorry, the very challenging, humid, um, basic road system in the Solomon Islands, which caused a problem to the Australian Defence Force going back, gosh, 20 years ago. Next then is the climate issue. If you're dealing in the east of the Ukraine, and it's middle of winter, you're dealing with about minus 15, minus 20 Celsius. That's going to have some challenges on how you build a vehicle and the ramifications through to the, uh, the support of the vehicle. If, as in the case of my first project, dealing with, um, and Justin has too, in Iraq, in the middle of summer, and it's you know, 50 degrees, and then you're standing in the sun with radiant heat coming off the paved road underneath the engine bay, and you're in idle mode because you've got a principal who's in a meeting and he needs to be able to go straight out because of security. This is going to have a significant impact on how you design and configure the vehicle. Road conditions. Talk about again East, uh, East Ukraine. We did a lot of work out there for the OSCE. And you've got potholes that are, they're just huge. And they're everywhere. And now this is going to have a, pardon the pun, an impact on, uh, on brace and suspension and the body armour and the welding and the interrelationship with the soft steel engine bay frame. Threats. Other threats where the vehicle is going to be operating, the area of operation, is it primarily ballistic? Are there blasts? Is it under vehicle blast? Is it through narrow laneways when in fact there is a, a more significant threat of somebody throwing a grenade onto the roof? And if that's the case, do you really want to put a roof rack on that roof? Sure, you can put something on the roof rack because I need to transport uh, an extra suitcase, weigh that up against the consequence of having a grenade thrown onto a roof rack that cannot roll off and then uh, exploding. The next comes then to the risk appetite. And this is always a challenge for procurement agencies and country officers is how much risk is the principal prepared to accept? And we were talking about escape hatches before and I recall my early days in DFAT and my uh, director would say, well, what about escaping the vehicle? And I'd say, well, that's a challenge. Well, we need an escape hatch. We need to do this, that and the other. And that's terrific. But technically, it was actually very, very challenging. So it's a case through a risk management approach and through that structured uh, process, looking at risks, looking at the likelihood of something occurring, the consequences the assessment of that, and then any mitigation strategies that you may do. And there are some agencies where the risk appetite is next to zero. Well, you're going in harm's way. There will be risk. And you can't avoid risk unless you're not there. You can only mitigate the risks. And that needs to be considered in the design and the requirements process. And the other aspect is that of the mission profile. You know, is the vehicle being left alone? Is there always somebody in the vehicle? Is there a requirement, as we had in Baghdad, that 
our security people had to be in the vehicle with the air conditioning on in idle mode for hours waiting for the ambassador to come out of the, uh, of the meeting. They couldn't park in the shade 100 yards down the road with the engine off. Maybe the engine won't start again. Now the ambassador's at risk. That's unacceptable. That has a direct impact on how you then design and ultimately build the vehicle. So again, it's a holistic approach. There's a systems-wide approach. I'm, I was trained as a systems engineer rather than a what I call a hard engineer or software. I struggle with computers. <laughs> um, and I'm not, I'm not a mathematically uh, uh, gifted to be able to be a, uh, a civil engineer or an uh, electronics engineer, etc. But I come from a systems engineering basis. And all these parts need to fit in together. And they all influence the ability to maintain the field, uh, the vehicle in the field. First is the choice of base vehicle. Um, you may want the extra space for Chevrolet Suburban. It's a great vehicle, but you put in the narrow alleyways of some of the, uh, the cities that require an armoured vehicle, and this now becomes a very challenging uh, vehicle along the way. The 300 series Toyota, beautiful vehicle, but in your and some of the very remote areas of Africa, it's really hard to maintain. But if you've got a Land Cruiser 76, which is far more mechanical rather than electronic, then it makes life that little bit easier. Brakes and suspension. Uh, we're talking again, poor road conditions, we're talking about climate issues. Matching the braking and suspension, there's a homologation issue, and uh, Meira will be talking about that a bit later on today. But it's also that interconnection with the system as a whole and the ability to get spare parts, the ability to replace those spare parts in a cost and time efficient manner. The tyres, runs and run flats. Bless you. <laughs> um, they are also part of it. As I said to a client two days ago when we finished off a report for him, the only thing connecting your armoured vehicle to the road is the tyre. And if the tyre is not of the right configuration, the right rating, if it's not maintained together with the rim, the run flat, etc., cetera, uh, then you can have the best protection that there is, but you now have a significant problem. And it's terrific that you've got the best tyre, but if it takes you four months to get through the uh, uh, supply chain to get that tyre, you've got a problem. Communications, how are you going to talk to people? How are you going to get help when it is that it's needed? Transparent armour, a significant part of this. And this was actually a, a true picture. This was taken in Erbil, where the, uh, the local Kurdish commander was very proud to show that he was able to get visibility to the horizon by taking an old windscreen and putting it in his sandbags. And, uh, and that was where he could protect his people and still have some visibility. Sometimes low-tech works. The opaque armour, both its construction, the materials and the, uh, the area in which uh, it is there. Again, as uh, Nira said yesterday, the, the, the lightest armour is the armour that doesn't exist. And there is this ongoing conversation about armouring the rear cargo. Its weight, its cost, changes the dynamics of the vehicle. Is it really, really necessary? Maybe it is just armouring behind the, uh, the back seat. It's a conversation. Spare parts, how they're bought, where they're stocked, how, what's the lead time, what are the instructions for their fitment, who knows how to fit it, all has an impact. And then again, the maintenance facility. We've seen some maintenance facilities in Africa particularly that are just barely a shed and a couple of spanners. And that, that facility is entrusted in maintaining a civilian armoured vehicle. That's going to have, again, an impact. So it then moves into writing the specification, and we've all been involved in one way or another. I won't spend too much time on it, but it needs to be specific. It needs to be clear. It needs to avoid jargon. We reviewed for a client just this week this specification, and he said, upgraded brakes. Well, what does that mean? The up armour is in the room. Someone comes and says, I want upgraded brakes. Well, you, know, you can extrapolate because you've been in the business, but it's... It's just not good enough. Um, has to be a very clear definition of what the vehicle should be capable, what that component should be capable to do. 
For the procurement agencies, it means making sure that the, that the document is user-friendly and is workable for the up armor so they don't have to guess what you really want. Otherwise, they will end up selling you a vehicle that they want to sell rather than a vehicle that you want to buy. Very distinct differences. Then there's the tender uh, procurement process. Being there, done that, it's all part and parcel of it. And as you go through, you're going to be interacting with senior management. And so it's important, therefore, that senior management understand when they see a document or they see a policy that you're putting in to a, into a contract that, in fact, there is a robust reason and there is a rationale why this is there because the bloke in the field who has to fix this vehicle is not going to be able to do his job if we don't get it right here in the tender. We go then into the manufacturing process and we certainly advocate for a start, most people will be doing this I'm sure, a start of project meeting. And this is a meeting of minds so that when the up armourer has received the contract, they've spent the first five minutes celebrating, thank you, fantastic, we've got business, now the challenge is we have to build it. And they look at the written document, they might ne not necessarily understand what's going on in the thought process of the procurement agency. And so it's important that there is a meeting at the start of the project, go line by line by line. When we say this, this is what we mean. Oh, I thought you meant that. No, I mean this. And I want you to build the vehicle the way I want it because I'm the customer, I'm paying the bills. And so it's very important, setting expectations. The number one lesson I learned when I was with the DMO is if you're going to be a successful project manager, is manage expectations up and down the chain. And so as the procurement agency is setting the expectations to the up armour right at the very beginning, what you expect, no surprises. Then there's a review of the design. And again, it's not changing the design because it's a certified product. But understanding what the dynamics of the vehicle and the design will be and how you know when it, the vehicle gets into your field operation what your problems will be and you can relate that back up the process through to the up armour so that assessments can be made. A very simple and uh, common issue is the door opening and uh, up armourers will put on a, a door strap or a strut that will control and limit the movement of the, of the door. Terrific. But it's happened many a time when that's been looked at. The user has said to the up armourer, it's just not wide enough. You need to lengthen the strap that you're attaching and it might be by another centimetre. makes a huge different difference to the people getting in and out of the vehicle. And here's the, the, the point that you can then put in these life of type and fleet management issues into the beginning of the process rather than when it's too late. There's an armour in, uh, inspection process and we certainly recommend that this be done by all agencies to all manufacturers. If there is a, uh, an armouring welding issue that occurs in the field, it's a heck of a lot more difficult to fix than it is to sort it out at the factory before the, the actual uh, vehicle is fitted out. Pre-delivery. Up armourers are very good at what they do and they have a quality assurance program and they will present the vehicle to you and they're saying this vehicle is 100%. Terrific. Anyone in procurement will know and fleet management will know it's not 100%. It might be 97%, but that last 3%, if that goes into the field, that tiny little problems is going to take that much resource to fix. Fix it in the factory. These are bespoke vehicles. The arm armor, up armor has, has integrity and desire to make this vehicle the best they possibly can. But mistakes are going to happen. It's not going to be perfect. Here's the opportunity to get it right before it goes in the field and it becomes a huge problem. Configuration management. What configuration management is all about, very simply, is to understand that as vehicles are produced, vehicle 1, 52, 135, they're not going to all be exactly the same. 
Things change. Glass manufacturers may not be around. Tyres may change. Brakes may change. But having a management program to understand what those changes are and those changes are then managed and, and, and regulated, that's the critical element. So there are, there are three areas. Firstly, just conceptually, is understanding the challenges of change, having the documentation for it, and it covering the vehicle as a whole. Looking at engineering processes, which the UP Armourers should have as part of their QA, and as part of your work with them, so that if there is a change, it's declared, it's reviewed, it's approved, and then it's documented. So when the vehicle gets into the field and they look at uh, the brakes and they go, these aren't the brakes that were in the documents, they've changed. And everyone tends to look at each other going, well, I don't know anything about this. In a configuration management program, you actually can do this quite. It's complex, but it's not that uh, complicated. Again, the benefits, therefore, is that as you have rolling out more vehicles over time into multiple areas, there's integrity and transparency about how the vehicle is built and what the repair program might be. I'm sure there's at least one person in this room who has bought a replacement brake or suspension system for a vehicle in Planet X, and it's arrived and it doesn't fit because the, manuf the up armor has supplied a, the current brake or, or, or shock absorber, but the design, something to do with the vehicle, was not that when they first built it. And now you've got a supply chain issue. Through life support, some fundamental and some key issues along the way. Um, whole of life. Everything you do has got to be considered about the whole of life. Even from procurement, looking, it might cost 220,000 or 185,000 euros, dollars, to buy a vehicle. That's not where it stops. Over the 10 years, what is that life of type costing going to be? And it might be spending a little bit more today that's going to save you a lot more down the track. And maybe it is that the policy might be seven years disposal. Maybe you can go 10 years. Generally, the base vehicles can if they're well maintained, and the vehicle can if the program is there for it. Training, and we'll talk more about uh, training uh, in this conference. But again, the country office, the drivers, the fleet managers, the workshops, they need to be trained in order to then support the vehicle out in the field. Spare parts, again, replacements, upgrades, forward logistics bases so that it's not six weeks to get a, a, uh, a spare into a remote area. It might be one week because it's housed in a centralised area um, of that particular country. Technical support, we've talked about documentation and manuals and responsiveness. And, you know, we have great respect for the up armourers. Sometimes the responsiveness for uh, fleet management and repair and spare parts is not as good as it could be. So I'll just be very gently critical to say there's always room for improvement there and, and the end users, they've got a vehicle off the road, they've got a mission to be done, they need this to happen and they need better service. Um, it comes back again to the procurement, we talked about that life cycle, that whole of life approach, looking at the budgets and making sure that there is budget for spare parts and for training, not just for the procurement. And it's hard when you're dealing with the budget office of a large organisation. Next part is then, you know, bringing into account the various stakeholders and having them buy in and being a top-down and, an and a bottom-up approach along the way. So what it impacts, what it really turns is, in the fleet management sphere, you've got a lot of data. You know how many of your litres of fuel was put in? You know what the cost was? You know that you went through ten, uh, ten spares of, of brakes in the last year or whatever. But that data has to be converted into information. We're starting to connect some dots here. And that then transposes into knowledge, where you're now connecting the dots. We're using more fuel because we've got problems with the, because of the roads or because of a lack of servicing, etc. We're now starting to connect those dots. That leads into insight and then leads into wisdom. And having consistency and a whole approach will give you that for your vehicle. 
And now you can start to make an impact. Be a many a time where a senior manager has come and said, oh, um, what about this? And you'll say, well, I, I don't know. Well, he wants you to come up. They want you. Uh, for you to come up with an answer so they can so you can make an impact upon them. How to make an impact? Develop systems within your organisation that takes all of this into account. Take ownership. Uh, the nature of bureaucracy is, that's not my job. I just buy the spare parts. I'm not involved in the training. Well, you, you kind of are. And you need to take ownership of that holistic approach. Management support. Um, sometimes it's challenging, and in many cases it's not, it is challenging because senior management don't understand the product. They don't understand the challenges. They don't understand the risks and the consequences. And therefore, having them buy in by educating them and advising them in due time. Again, no surprises, and you'll get, uh, you can get greater buy-in from them. You have to have money. There's no two ways about it. If there's not enough budget, you're just going to struggle and the fleet is going to struggle and you're going to go back through, you know, do, you'll go, packed, go back past go again, but you won't collect the $200. Training. Everyone needs training. Organisations are not as good as um, training when it comes to civilian armoured vehicles and all the different aspects. And training, as I said, down. Not just the drivers but the fleet managers and the country officers, the workshops, they need to understand and be trained how to support your vehicle in the field. You need record keeping, whether it's manual spreadsheets, which I used to use, and it doesn't, it works, it works fine. Or you might have a, 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 a whole software system that integrates back into procurement and into budget. Fantastic. Getting the data input in the field is a challenge. No two ways around it. You need to find ways around it, though. And finally, then, is relationships with the suppliers. Everyone complains about the price of spares from the up armors. And on one hand, you're right. On the other hand is the suppliers, whether components, spares, uh, the inputs to production, the up armors themselves, they need to make money. They need to make profit. If they don't make profit, they're not going to be around to service and support your vehicle into the future. It has to there has to be a symbiotic relationship. They need to make money. You need to pay the price. At the same time, Mr and Mrs uh, Up Armourers, you know, understand that there are budget constraints and you need to work together in this relationship. We had the three, uh, uh, the three videos when it started. We had Hussein Bolt, who 100 metre champion, uh, the Melbourne Cup winner, the Cup is one of the richest horse races in the world. And then my favourite football team who just aren't... They, they win, but they're not that great um, in kicking. And that goal, how that ball turned and, and, and created a goal. Winners are grinners, but it's not just the bloke kicking the goal. It's not just the Hussein Bolt charging down the 100-metre uh, dash and the, and the horse winning the race. There is a teamwork approach. There is that, again, that holistic approach. And our jobs in industry and jobs in procurement and the suppliers and the up armourers and the people in the field is to work, therefore, as a team and convince their superiors and those people on the periphery, all the stakeholders, that there has to be this team approach if we're going to be winners and if we're going to be grinners. Famous Chinese proverb, which I'm sure you've heard before, Four things come but don't return back. The broken word, the spent arrow, past life and neglected opportunity. I'm going to suggest that there's five things that don't come back. And an armoured vehicle that's sitting in the field that's broken, that costs a lot of money to buy, is needed to protect people's life and if it's not getting fixed, that's neglected opportunity and something that we do have control over. And anything you can take away from, uh, from this presentation is that go back to the office and go, you know what, I think we need to start engaging more broadly and with more forethought in order to make sure that our very expensive vehicles, we're getting the most out of them as best we can. So thank you for your time. My details are, are here. You can see us on our website along the way. 
Um, thank you for, uh, for being here at the forum and for, for listening.